They were John's. There you go. Apostle John, he was the one who started those congregations. Those were his congregations that he began. So he's writing specific. But across all, all of Galatia and into Helen and throughout Judea and Samaria and all through that, every congregation has the same things and issues going on. But he writes these specifically because these are the churches that he was responsible for. Okay. So let's hear Revelations 2, verse 12. Now, we're, we're going to walk away from Ahab for just a minute. We're going to go back to him in a minute. But let's go here and read here. To the angel of Messiah's community in Pergamum, right? Verse 14. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teachings of Balaam. Okay? Let's go back. What are the teachings of Balaam? Balaam. Okay. Yeah, so what did Balaam, what did Balaam teach the Moabites and Midianites to do? How to take down leadership. How to take down leadership. And how to use sexual morality and idolatry to do that. And she talked. So this, so can you imagine? This could have been a congregation of 50, 60, 70 people. And there was somebody in there who was spreading the same doctrines inside of them. Very, very, very... Very cynical in nature, but very very subtle a lot of times. And the people were not picking it up. And this is important because this congregation believed in Yeshua. They were keeping the feast and the commandments. But somebody had slithered in there and they used the same tactic. There's probably an elder of this church whose wife was influencing him. And he was saying, you know, and they would say, well, should we go to the market and bring this idol meat into our church? And and have it on the feast days. Oh, yeah, it should be a problem. Huh? It's not a problem. It's a lot cheaper. It's a lot cheaper. You know, you don't have to. <laughs> right. There's somebody in there. There was somebody in there. Remember, there's always this, you know, there's always a snake in the wood pile. This is true. But guess what? The church of Pergamum did not recognize it. But John did. Through the Holy Spirit. Now, where is John when he writes this? He's on an island. He's miles away from this place, so how does he see it? This is why you can't see through the eyes of man to recognize these things. You have to see them through the eyes of the Holy Spirit to be able to reveal these things to you so you can call them out. And you go to the elders and say, this is what I've witnessed. We need to stop it. And if the elders don't react, that's a problem. It is. If the pastor of that church doesn't do anything about it, that's a problem. Because now you have leaders who are being influenced with the teachings of Balaam. Remember what I said, you've got to pray for the wives, you've got to pray for your husbands, husband, you've got to pray for your wives, because it slithers in pretty easily. All right, so let's go. Um, who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who was teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat food, sacrifice to idols, and commit sexual morality. Those same two, two twins there. And here we see that somebody had gone, as I said before, had gone in the congregation and enticed them to do idolatry. Verse 5. Likewise, you have those who hold on to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Okay. What is the teaching of the Nicolaitans? For those who were not here this morning in our Bible study, what is the teaching of Nicolaitans? David. <laughs> what are the teaching of the Nicolaitans? Anybody know? Top down structure like the Catholic Church. That's part of it. It's <laughs> part of it. But it's even more than that. Okay? It's not only the top down structure, it's a controlling structure that nobody in the body can operate or act or to bring their gifts up. Okay? A church should have a structure always. Okay? If a congregation doesn't have a structure, it's what? Chaos. Chaos. It has to have a structure. So you have to have a structure. But if the people in the body of believers are not acting in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, if you're not seeing manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then that means the structure is either too strong and it's forcing it out, or it's not being taught. It's one of the two things. Okay? Because if the structure doesn't believe in the powers of the works of the Holy Spirit, then he's not going to teach about it, then nobody's going to pray and ask for the Lord to reveal it to them, okay? But at the same time, it can also be the leadership that's trying to keep that from going. Because somebody says, well, I had a dream, and you go, don't bring those dreams around here. We don't want that here, all right? You must have an ear to at least listen, and then you must have somebody who has a gift of discernment to be able to understand if it really truly is the Lord. You've got to have that balance there. All right. Likewise, you have those who hold on to the teachings of Nicolaitans repent, then if not... I will come to you and soon make war with them with the sword of my mouth. Let me ask you a question. Who wants Yeshua to come bring a sword against us? I, honestly. Satan mm wants -hmm. that. He wants your destruction, but who should ever want or desire that? And then if you have those things in your, you've got to get rid of them. Yeah. 
It's destructive. It may destroy you before it even, even the sword comes against you. Because we have witnessed, Carmen and I have witnesses, where we came from in Tampa, and we saw this work in a congregation, and we saw it destroy it, it and, and it wobbled this congregation for two years before finally it's gotten back on its feet. But it's because the elders of leadership did not put protective and protections in place to keep that from happening. It's very important. And I know this is what I noticed when it happened in Tampa. What I noticed more than anything else is it went after those who had the gift of discernment and got rid of them. It, it tried to get rid of them first. Because when it could get rid of people who had discernment, there's nobody who could speak up and say, wait a minute, this is a false spirit. That's what I noticed. And Carmen, you know what I'm talking about. Because back then, I remember very clearly, it was those two individuals who left first because they saw things they didn't like, and we lost our guard. We lost that protection. All right. The Nicolaitans doctrine we discussed earlier. Well, so here's the question. What's the opposite of the Nicolaitan doctrine? Let's read what Peter says. 1 Peter 5, 1 says, Therefore I appeal to the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness. I'm, this, I'm, a, I'm just like you. I'm an elder. And a witness of Messiah's suffering and a partaker. Also the glory of God to be revealed. Verse 2. Verse, verse 2. Shepherd God's flock among you. Watch over it. Not under compulsion. Don't do it because you have to. Do it because you love to help and shepherd your people. You must do it with complete love. Do it with compulsion, but willing before God, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. Look at what it says. But don't lord it over those apportioned to you, but become examples of the flock. So the opposite of the Nicolaitan doctrine is this. Okay? This is saying that you do things with love. You don't do it for your own selfish gain. You do things because you want to make them grow and edify and build them up. That's the opposite of the Nicolaitan doctrine. So that's it. Amen. Write this down. Because this is the tab this. Put a tab in your scripture verse. Underline it. Because this is the balance of the congregation. This is how it should work. That, that comes from when Yeshua asked Peter, do you love me? Right. Those three times. Yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yes. All right, so let's look at Revelations 2.18. says, the angel of Messiah. This is to another church, another congregation. This is the community at Thyatira Right. Now, this actually states what we're talking about so far. But this is I have against you, that you tolerate the, that you, I have this against you because you have tolerance for this false teaching. Listen, mm -hmm. tolerance, mm -hmm. you put up with it, you don't call it out. But I have this against you because you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Okay, Remember a few sermons ago I was telling you, we need the gift of prophecy, but it must be an unselfish gift. We have to have it because it edifies the body. But when you have somebody who has sole personal gain and is calling himself a prophet and has taken advantage of it, it has the spirit of Jezebel in it. Here's what it says. Who calls herself a prophet, yet she is teaching and deceiving my servants to commit what? Sexual morality and to eat food sacrificed to what? I. You notice these pairs always go together. It's because it's, it's about this, remember, a shrine worship of the ancient Near East was very prevalent. Now, you don't see anybody doing this in the Lord King with today. You don't see this, okay? You don't even go on the outskirts and see this stuff. But it's still there. It's just not as prevalent the way this was, where Judah would go down the road and see this, what he thought was a shrine priest who was his daughter-in-law. He didn't go that on. So back then, you knew because they dressed a certain way, it looked a certain way, smelled a certain way. It was what it was. But today, it's a little more subtle, but it's still there. Yes, Speaking of the, 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 the food sacrifice to idols, one subject that came up with among believers a few years ago was the subject of halal meat. Would halal meat be considered? Of course it would. Yeah. Yeah. Of course it would. Because a lot of the congregations went, well, it's okay. It's not but okay. It's, it's got a kosher stamp right beside it. The rabbis are blessing it, so it's okay for us. Well, the rabbis are wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's it's not. Anything sorry. that's offered, anything that's murdered to an ancestor, to any other God that's not Yehovah, have nothing to do with it. Now, trust me, guys, those aren't. Paul says they aren't gods. They're nothing, right? But we don't want stumbling blocks, and we don't want that to go to, we don't want to put that on our record, okay? Remember, we got a record. Don't put that on our, don't bring it in the congregation, don't let it, don't let it come in there. And, and, and this is why I understand when those people chose to be vegetarians, I get it. You know, I get it. Paul's saying you're weak. 
because you don't have any, you know, you don't have the courage, you know. He's calling them weak, but I understand why they decided to be vegetarians, because they didn't want to be tempted by these things, because these things come pop up. But that's another story. Let's leave that for another day, all right? <laughs> Uh, these are pairs. Remember, these things come in pairs. Now, notice what the prophetess does. She has, she, she's coming to the elders, and she's claiming to be something. The elders are listening to her, and there's a spirit behind it. Okay. Now, I, the more you get in prayer, and the more you spend time, and the Holy Spirit begins to minister you, the more He'll make you aware of these things. The more He'll reveal motives inside of you. Now, you go look at it. Let's go back and look at First Peter. Okay? Let's look at leaders. Let's look at their motivations here. Okay? Watch over, not under compulsion. Leaders, don't do something because you have to. Okay? There's, so how do you know I'm doing something for you have to? Well, you, you have to pray, and you've got to look at your motive, your motives inside of you and say, is this my motivation for why I'm doing it? Or do I really love and care about these people that I'm working with, and I want to edify them, and I want to see success in their lives? You, as a leader, you have to check your motives. And as women in the congregation, you go look at your men and say, check your motives. Pray for them. Don't let their motives, your motivations are very, very important. Because where we can't see that, because you wear a nice suit and tie and all, you know, we, we're not in Texas, but, but people <laughs> wear a suit and tie somewhere out there. They, uh, you, they may look good on the outside, but the motivation, the Holy Spirit knows their heart. Yeah. All right, so it's important that you know about the motivations there. Here's what he says. Behold, I will throw her. Now notice what he's going to do to this, the one who has uh, the spirit. Behold, I will throw her into a sick bed. I'm going to make her sick. She's going to get cancer. She's going to get some type of disease or something's going to happen to her. And those who commit adultery with her are going to go into a great tribulation. Now, tribulation is not just chaos. Tribulation is your life just fell apart completely. You'll recognize it. Dysfunction. It's in it, tribulation. Just to read the entire book of Revelation. You know what tribulation is. But the, the fact of the matter is, there's nothing good going on in that congregation with that individual, so they're going to be brought against them. All right, here we go. Unless they repent of their doing. Now, you can stop all of this in a. Just like that. Yes. Say it again. It can all go away if you just repent. True. Right? Just repent. So that's it. That makes it go away. I will also strike your children with a deadly disease that all of us eyes can need to know. This is why this has to happen. First of all, we need to, we need to worship a God of justice and righteousness. That's the most important. If God did not bring justice here, and he allowed this to go on, that would, how can you serve a God that allows this to continue, right? He'll give it its time and day. It may be a long time, but at some point he's got to bring justice. Uh, then all of the size community will know that I am the one who searches minds and hearts. Keep that up. Always keep that in mind. He's going to look at your motivations constantly. And I'll give to you, each of you according to your deeds. All right. So here's, as, as, we, as we wrap this up today, these are the things that we're going to see have in common. There's going to be idolatry. And that idolatry, again, is not just a statue and a piece of wood, right? It's theories and belief systems. And it, it could be. It could be. It just depends. Uh, it could be stuff that's controlling people's lives and destruction. We just got to be careful, you know. We need people to discern on these things. The second thing, if there's no sexual morality attached to it, okay, there's got to be, remember they're pairs, okay? Somebody may become obsessed with something, it doesn't give necessarily the, the, the spirit of Jezebel in it, unless there's sexual morality attached to it. There's also a controlling spirit of other people, okay? This is a big one. This is a big one. I want people to repent and change. Does everybody not want that? I want, I want to constantly get better and improve. And it's hard for me to tell somebody you need to repent because these are things that are going to destroy you. Right? But the controlling spirit is going to try to keep you from even mentioning those words. All right? It'll change the subject. It'll try to veer you in a different direction. Okay? Divisiveness and destruction is the eventual reality of what comes out of these things. That's the eventual reality, okay? So in each one of these cases, Yahweh sends a true prophet. He teaches and sends a prophet in every case. And I want to read this as we stop here today, because I want you to see how judgment works out. But Jehoshaphat, let's go back to Ahab now. King of Judah. Jehoshaphat said, Is there no longer a prophet other than I here that we may inquire of? Now the king of Israel and the king of Jehoshaphat. Now notice what they do. I want you, I want you just... If you could just get a picture in your eyes of what's going on here, and I'm going to try to describe it to you. 
I got these two kings, right? And they're on a threshing floor at the, at, the, at the edge of the gates. And at the gates is where all the elders set up. And they're probably, they've got it really sophisticated at these edge of the gates. Because there, they probably have seats or places where these chairs, these thrones would go into place, right? And then the elders would probably have chairs and stuff would be set up around them. And then the population would get around that and they would see decisions being made. But notice how it's described. You've got the king of Israel, the king of Jehoshaphat of Judah were sitting each on his throne arrayed in their robes. They had, they had splendor, they had all the colors, everything. This was an amazing scene. But what is it doing? This is, be a, this is a shadow of things in the heavenly realm. I want you to see this, okay? Each of us had a throne arrayed in their robes and a threshing floor at the entrance of Samaria's gate. And all the prophets were prophesying before them. Now Zedekiah, son of Kenanah, made himself irons of horn and thus said, Adonai, with these you will gore the Arameans until they are consumed. Then all the prophets, when this guy does this, this guy named Zedekiah, he builds his, he builds his basically statue of, out of metal, okay? And he has these horns on it. Now, there, we won't get, go down to why he did this, but he puts these horns on it, and then he says that, says, we should go to war. All the people are standing out there, and he builds this thing, it's made out of metal, and all these other 400 prophets of Asher go, that's what we should do. You just saw it, and then they just start talking. And they're just, just rumbling on and prophesying, doing all this stuff. And it's chaos, probably. Yeah. But if there's, there's a system set up in place. They have these thrones set up. Okay? Now, as this is going on, let's take a look at what's going on in the heaven. Now. <laughs> Meanwhile, the messenger went, that went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are uniform, declaring favor to the king. So please let your word, like the word of one of them, speak favorably. So Micaiah says this. As Adonai lives, what Adonai says to me that I will speak.